what we speak about as history was actually the result of a lot of accidents, lucky breaks, uh, things that were unanticipated. Uh, and we all have choices to make. And so, for example, democracy is not going to survive unless people want democracy. <laughs> Francis Fukuyama rocketed onto the scene in 1989 with his article, The End of History, published by the National Interest, just as the Berlin Wall came tumbling down and liberal democracy strutted triumphantly across Eastern Europe and much of the rest of the world. Armed with a BA from Cornell, where he studied with Alan Bloom, and a PhD from Harvard, where he studied with Samuel Huntington, Frank Fukuyama continued his sharp-eyed analysis of the contemporary world in a series of important books over the next 20 years, culminating in many ways with his recent sweepingly ambitious two-volume work on the past and the future of liberal democracy. The first volume, The Origins of Political Order, appeared in 2012, and the second is now out, Political Order and Political Decay from the Industrial Revolution to the Globalization of Democracy. Frank wrote these books from his perch as a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute on International Studies at Stanford University. Well, I call these uh, two recent volumes, two parts of the same work, uh, a kind of culmination. Uh, am I right about that? How do you see them in the, uh, against the rest of Europe? Well, that's right. Uh, I wrote The End of History 25 years ago, and in a sense, these two volumes are meant to be uh, kind of updating uh, of everything I've learned in that uh, quarter century. So I do feel it is kind of a culmination. And uh, where do you go from here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can retire now. <laughs> yes, uh, is it? <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I, you know, there's also, a, uh, my, my career has been sort of split between more theoretical, you know, grand, you know, uh, uh, thinking types of, of pieces and very practical uh, policy related things. And actually, I don't say much about policy in either of these two volumes, but there's still an agenda of practical things that need to be done in terms of improving the quality of government both in the United States and abroad. And so I think that's largely what's going to preoccupy me. I see. Now, let me ask you, uh, let me try to put these two recent books in the context of your earlier work in a slightly different way. Um, you're, you're well known, of course, for the end of history thesis or your version of the end of history thesis. And in, in your first book and in the article that preceded it, um, you argued that the world seemed to be reaching its goal or to perhaps uh, almost have reached its goal of enjoying a, a happy if somewhat boring life uh, in liberal democracy. And you called liberal democracy the final form of human government uh, in, 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 I think, both the article and the book. But in the recent work, you emphasize that liberal democracy is not universal, that it's, in fact, retreating in many areas of the world and is subject to decay, even where it has been long established. So have you changed your mind on that? What has happened to the end of history? Mm -hmm. Well. I think the, the, the basic foundation is still there, but, uh, but it's been modified. So the end of history was always about whether there is a direction to historical development. And really, you know, prior to 1989, uh, when the article came out, progressive intellectuals around the world said, yes, there is such a thing as history, and it's leading towards socialism or communism. Uh, and my observation was a really simple one back then, which is that it didn't look like we're ever going to get there. Mm -hmm. And this was done, you know, uh, prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it was very clear that there was a moral rot inside that system. And if history was leading in any direction, it seemed to be leading towards what the Marxists called bourgeois democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's still true. So in the years since from 1970 to 2015, uh, the number of electoral democracies around the world has expanded from about 35 to maybe 115 mm -hmm. today. Uh, so it's the dominant uh, uh, form of government of a majority of the countries around the world. And, and 
I think we sometimes forget the amount of progress that's been made over the last two generations. But it is definitely the case that we're in a democratic recession and that there are many challenges. And I think you know, one theme that I did not at all emphasize when I wrote that original book was the possibility of going backwards. I mean, that's the, that's the theme of political decay. And, and how, how backwards is it possible to go? Well, that's... Uh, I mean, is there a kind of floor, a democratic floor under political development such that no major country that is a, you know, an industrialized and, and uh, an advanced democracy could slide all the way back to some form of autocracy? Uh, but other governments might still be subject to backsliding, or is there is is uh, is there no such floor? Well, I I don't know the answer to that. I I, I would think that democracy as a norm has become so uh, entrenched that it's just very hard to imagine the United States or or Europe, uh, you know, moving back uh, in a big way. But one of the troubling things uh, that's happened in the last year is, for example, in Hungary, you have this. Uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who mm -hmm. basically, you know, and Hungary was one of the former communist countries that looked like it was the most, it was the earliest to make a transition to being a full member right. of the European Union and NATO and so forth. Uh, and he gave a speech last um, uh, year basically praising illiberal democracy or saying that that was the model. And so uh, it does seem to me that uh, that's a really important, not, not that Hungary is that consequential a country in itself, but it's a, it's a warning sign that uh, I don't think we can take liberal democracy for granted. Well, is it, is it still possible to, uh, to speak, as President Obama does uh, frequently, of the right side of history and a wrong side of history, in your view? <laughs> uh, I don't think that there is a inevitable historical process that's somehow grinding along and that will push things in, in a given direction. The one thing that I think is very should be clear from the last two books I've written is that what we speak about as history was actually the result of a lot of accidents, lucky breaks, uh, things that were unanticipated, uh, and we all have choices to make. And so, for example, democracy is not going to survive unless people want democracy. Mm -hmm. There's no automatic mechanism, and if there are challenges to democracy and people don't stand up to defend the principle and the practice, then it's not going to happen. Why should people want democracy, in your view? Well, so first of all, it's not just democracy. In, in, in my scheme of things, there's really three things that you need. You need a state that can actually do things like protect the community and you know deliver basic uh, public services. You need a uh, rule of law, which is a limitation on the state's power, fundamentally. Mm -hmm. And then you need accountability such that the government actually responds to the whole population and not just to its own uh, narrow interests. And I think that for uh, a number of reasons, uh, uh, if you want just an instrumental reason, this form of government has been tremendous for economic development. The richest countries in the world, mm -hmm. the most developed ones, uh, have this form of government. Uh, but I think that there's an intrinsic uh, role that both law and democracy play because I don't believe that you can be a full human being unless you participate in your mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. governance, and, and unless you're somehow self-governing. Uh, I think that if people are simply the recipients of benevolence from a government that they have no control over, you know, they're incomplete human beings. And so I think that aspect of agency is important. I think law and rights are important because it's, it's, a, it's a sign of dignity that mm -hmm. I have the right to speak, I have the right to participate, I have the right to assemble with my fellow citizens, uh, and I'm not a child. I, you know, so all of those things, I think, are reasons why people should prefer liberal democracy. Mm -hmm.